Today, Amazon reportedly wants to buy MGM Film Studios as the streaming wars heat up in the wake of the Discovery Warner Media merger. Plus, one of the most famous short sellers has a new target, Tesla. And finally, the retailers are all right. We round up the biggest highlights from this morning's slate of earnings reports. I'm Pippa Stevens, and this is CNBC After Hours. It's red across the board as the major averages close at the lows of today's trading session. Tesla shares managed to close essentially flat following a 2% loss yesterday after it was revealed in a regulatory filing that Michael Burry, of the big short fame, is betting against the electric car maker. After a 740% gain in 2020, Tesla shares have fallen more than 18% this year and are currently trading more than 35% lower than their all-time high from the end of January. But is it a good idea to bet against Elon Musk? We asked Laura Kaladny to explain. Everyone's worked up about Michael Burry having a short position in Tesla because Michael Burry is the investor best known for the big short and more recently a big long. He was the first to really call it before the subprime mortgage crisis and to profit off of that. And then more recently he had a long outlook on GameStop. So when someone like him takes a short position in Tesla, no matter the size, it's noteworthy. Michael Burry used to be fairly active on Twitter. He has since been quieter on Twitter, but from past tweets since deleted, we know that he called out Tesla's reliance on regulatory credit sales to be profitable as a red flag. These are credits that companies can get from producing clean energy or clean energy vehicles, zero emission vehicles. Tesla, obviously, since all they make is electric vehicles, has more of these than other automakers that are only starting to make battery electrics. In the past, big automakers had to purchase a lot of these from Tesla. They did that to offset their own carbon footprint until they could make more battery electrics and more zero emission vehicles. They needed to offset their environmental footprint in some way. And Tesla doesn't have to be you know, transparent in the moment when they sell these credits or what price and to whom. Uh, they can just sort of state and record the revenue practically when they want to, and it goes straight to the bottom line. It's great for their margins. Burry's point, as I read it, is that with more automakers uh, getting in the game with battery electrics, zero emission vehicles, uh, that affects demand for the credits from Tesla, right? They may not me need as many or any at all from Tesla. If nobody needed Tesla's credits, that would call into question Tesla's ability to be profitable. It's something to watch. The thing on the bull side of that argument, uh, the thing that permables who just love Tesla and, and see the stock going up, up and up, you know, they see environmental regulations increasing and they don't think the regulatory credit market will be impacted too much. But people ask me all the time, like, who are these short sellers that would bet against Elon Musk? The truth is a lot of shorts cover their positions. There aren't as many short sellers that are naked short. Peter Thiel, really influential venture investor has said not, you know, not to bet against Elon Musk, et cetera. Why do people still do it? I think they just think Tesla is overvalued. There's a lot of future growth baked into the stock price. Um, people have taken Elon Musk's uh, promises and ambitions at face value, but how, how close are we really to having a robo taxi network? It's, it's nowhere in sight. Okay, let's get to our sound check. Here's a roundup of the day's biggest action and what the top newsmakers and business leaders had to say on CNBC's airwaves. It's a little bit like musical chairs. There are a bunch of, uh, bunch of people kind of circling around. It looks like there's gonna be uh, certainly uh, th uh, three people of, of real scale, both in terms of subscribers as well as content. And that's uh, you know Netflix, Disney, and HBO Max. I think uh, the new uh, Warner Media Discovery combined has the library and the subscribers to permanently uh, you know cement its position there. Macro markets on Friday, we saw skittishness in tech so stocks. We saw brief equity sell off that's contributed to the sea of red in crypto. Tax season means they're selling across markets. And look, let's be very realistic. Bitcoin up 300% since the start of the year. It's very normal to see 25 to 40% corrections and pullbacks. What we're seeing, the majority of selling activity we've seen over the last week has been from new holders. saw this transaction 
margins came down from you know the pandemic stock up, but the basket size was up a meaningful amount. And what that tells me is Walmart is excelling in fashion, excelling in home, excelling in general merchandise, and adding those bigger ticket items to blend in with their grocery and CPG business. So I think there's a ton of momentum here. We saw a million eight people, one. 0.8 million people travel on Sunday. Um, we think that from Memorial, from Memorial Day to Labor Day, we're going to see between a million four and a million eight travel. Um, and then we think we'll see fares start to go up. AT&T shares closed lower for the second day in a row as investors continue to digest the news that the telecom company is essentially walking away from Warner Media, the conglomerate it created after buying Time Warner in 2018. In a shocking deal, Warner Media, which owns properties like CNN and HBO, will merge with Discovery, which just launched its very own direct-to-consumer service earlier this year. The fight to win share in the streaming universe is getting cutthroat, as Amazon is reportedly trying to buy MGM to add to its own content library. Everyone's trying to dethrone Netflix and Disney. AT&T just admitted defeat. So who's next? Alex Sherman can break it all down. In a vacuum, the idea that AT&T would spin out WarnerMedia or that Discovery would merge with a larger content company, both of those things independently, not that much of a surprise. But the fact that this deal happened now, that AT&T would throw in the towel, basically, on their vertical integration dreams. They bought Time Warner in a deal that closed in mid-2018. And AT&T, whose CEO is John Stanky, who was instrumental in buying Time Warner three years ago, the fact that he would decide so quickly to say, you know what, actually, it doesn't make any sense for Warner Media to be a part of AT&T. After we just spent a, more than $100 billion, if you include debt, on this transaction. All of those things are a big surprise that these two companies decided to do this deal now, which is a big indication that neither one of the companies was satisfied that they had the proper amount of global scale to compete against Netflix, Disney, and Amazon. The issue now, Peacock and Paramount Plus are now at a severe disadvantage. They are competing for fifth place. And it's unclear if there can even be five global subscribers. Comcast and Viacom CBS are now put in a position where they probably need to do one of two things. They probably either need to gain scale themselves, acquire more content, or sell. Brian Roberts, who owns Comcast, our parent company, has said for many years he has no intention of selling NBC Universal. He loves the business. If that's the case, I would put Comcast in the buyer category. So what can they buy? Lionsgate, they own stars and also a lot of library content. MGM, currently for sale. The information reported yesterday, they're in talks with Amazon. I know personally, they've spoken with Apple and Netflix and Comcast in the past. AMC Networks, owned by the Dolan family. Viacom CBS becomes a seller. And they're all of a sudden on the block looking to sell themselves. There are a lot of buyers out there. Maybe Apple decides they want to get into this business a little bit more. Uh, it's unclear, but I do know that something needs to happen with NBC Universal and Viacom CBS. Either they need to get bigger through acquisitions themselves or they need to sell. All right, time for our numbers round. Today, it's the retail earnings edition. We heard from three big retailers this morning and pulled the biggest figures from their reports. So let's start with 37. Walmart's US e-commerce sales jumped 37% from 2020 levels. And remember, this was the time last year when many Americans were hoarding cleaning supplies and dry goods for their pantries during lockdown. Walmart was open as an essential retailer, so even this year, as people left their homes and returned to pre-pandemic activities, those online sales still rose higher. The strong e-commerce performance helped drive Walmart's revenue to come in higher than Wall Street estimates. Next, 103 million. Macy's made $103 million last quarter, and this profit came as a surprise to Wall Street analysts who were expecting the department store to lose money. But stimulus checks from the government, paired with the robust COVID vaccine rollout, gave consumers more money and more confidence to head back to the mall. 
Macy's hiked its own forecast for the whole year, claiming the company sees strong momentum as customers shop for new outfits for weddings and vacations. In fact, the luggage category was one of the most improved from 2020 to 2021. And finally, 82. The average transaction size at Home Depot rose more than 10% last quarter to more than $82. The big box retailer also reported nearly 20% more total transactions. It's no surprise then that Home Depot crushed earnings estimates, delivering a 30% jump in sales from the same quarter last year. The booming housing market helped fuel sales growth, and even though lumber prices are higher, making it harder to build new homes, that helped Home Depot too, as homeowners decided to renovate their current homes. Get all the latest data in the red-hot housing market by going to CNBC.com and downloading the CNBC app. That's it for After Hours. We'll be back here in our home office every Tuesday and Thursday, so be sure to catch us then.